writers, you're listening to the Kobo Writing Life Podcast, where we bring you insights and inspiration for growing your self-publishing business, coming to you from Kobo's headquarters in Toronto. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Kobo Writing Life Podcast. I'm Stephanie, and today I have Marina joining me. Hi, everyone. And on today's episode, we are interviewing Dharma Kelleher. She's a gritty crime fiction writer. And to give you an idea of what she writes about, she has written books about lesbian biker gangs facing off against drug dealers and outlaw biker gangs, a transgender bounty hunter pursuing murders, tweakers, and human traffickers, and the mother of a rape victim who takes matters into her own hands when the justice system fails. And she had initially reached out to us when she heard our episode with Damon Swade, because on Damon's episode, he mentioned that he would want it to be known as a romance writer rather than a gay romance writer. And this had really resonated with Dharma with her experience as a transgender writer. Yeah, and this is actually a really special episode because beyond Dharma's experience, we also touched on a few topics that we haven't really discussed before on the podcast. One of them being sensitivity readers and when their assistance can come in handy during the writing and the editing process. We also talked to Dharma about authors having a responsibility to their audiences in regards to important topics and representation in all forms. So this is a really great interview. And if you're interested, please keep listening. So thank you, Dharma, for joining us on the Kobo Writing Life podcast today. Thank you for having me. And before we begin, can you just tell our listeners a bit about you? Well, I first started writing when I was a teenager back in the early 1980s and writing silly short stories on a manual Smith Corona typewriter. That's how far back it goes. I didn't even have an electric typewriter. It was manual. And so, and then I kind of drifted away from it for the better part of 30 years or so. And then I got back into it around 2007 with NaNoWriMo and did that a couple of years. And then I said, okay, maybe I can do something with this. And so I, I write uh, gritty crime fiction. And uh, my protagonists tend to be LGBT. So uh, my first series, the protagonist is a lesbian biker chick. And my current series is a bounty hunter who is transgender. And I'm also transgender and I'm pansexual. So just kind of writing characters that are like me. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And so can you just tell us about your publishing journey? Because you were both traditionally and also indie published. Right. Originally, I come from a background... You know, it was the the only options were the traditional publishing route. You writers market, and you try to find an agent, and then you got to hope and that that they'll get a publishing deal. By the time I was ready to pursue that, I was actually using QueryTracker.net, which is a great database, a great resource, and I used that to find a literary agent, uh, and I did, and she's really fabulous. And uh, she got me a deal with uh, one of Penguin Random House's digital first or digital only imprints. I was hoping for something a little bit better than that, but I said, hey, it's my first book, you know, no problem. Okay, we'll go with that. And so they published two of my books. And uh, they also insisted on acquiring my print rights, but they had no intention of doing it in print. And after they decided not to continue the series because uh, sales were not as stellar as they would have liked, I said, okay, what am I going to do now? And by this time, uh, indie publishing or self-publishing was more of a thing. And um, I thought, well, you know what? I realized that I'm a hard market to sell because people that... One of the reactions that I kept getting, my agent kept getting from the big five is, we really love this story, but we don't know how to market it. And the stories weren't about the characters being lesbian or transgender or anything like that. These are gritty crime fiction stories. It just happens to be that the characters are not straight. They're not cisgender. And so that seemed to be a deal breaker for a lot of these traditional publishers. So I said, you know what? I'm going to do it myself. And my wife helped me come up with the concept of a bounty hunter because I wanted to do something that was other than police procedural and, you know, private eye detective kind of thing. So I'm like, what can I do? And she came up with the idea of a bounty hunter. I'm like, okay. And I'd read a few of the um, Stephanie Plum uh, novels. Oh, they were a lot of fun, but I wanted to go a little bit grittier than that. Yeah. So, because it's just kind of the kind of fiction that I enjoy reading. And so uh, I hired a freelance editor and they got my book polished. I hired a professional cover designer, and they really created a great look for my uh, series, and I went from there, and things have gone really well. 
That's awesome. Did you find that you enjoyed the self-publishing route more than the traditional publishing? I do, primarily because it gives me a little bit more control over how the books look and uh, how they mar are marketed. Because, you know, I can't do AMS ads on my traditionally published books. That's I can only do them on the books that I publish myself because I'm not the publisher of record for the ones that Penguin Random House published. So I'm like, okay, so I wanted a little bit more control. I wanted to be able to just do more. I couldn't even do book signings with my first two books because they were digital only. And I couldn't get, you know, I can't, couldn't get the print rights. And it's like, so I wanted a little bit more control over how things were handled, how they were marketed. I knew the market a little bit better than they apparently did. And it really has worked out really well. And I don't have anything against the publisher. Um, I, you know, the people that I worked with at Alibi, which is the imprint, um, were all fabulous. They were absolutely fabulous. Very professional. It just wasn't a good situation for me. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and I've, I have lots of friends that are tradi traditionally published. Um, I have a lot of friends that were being published through Midnight Inc. And Midnight Inc. is closing its doors. And I almost went with them for my first books. And I'm like, oh, wow, now what I... <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing is, you know, with traditional publishing, you never know what's going to happen. You know, an imprint could be bought out by another company. Then that company may decide to discontinue. You never know what's going to happen. So there's not a lot of control. And so I wanted to have a little bit more control over my career as an author. Which I think is what a lot of people want. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Dharma, you actually recently listened to uh, one of our uh, episodes on the podcast. It was the interview that we had with uh, Damon uh, Swade. I wasn't a part yes. of the episode, but <laughs> there was. I wasn't either. It was Chrissy. Oh, yeah, it was Chrissy. That's true. That's true. And uh, you noted, actually, one of the things that he had mentioned that he said was that and I quote here, I don't want to be known as a writer of gay romance. I want to be known as a writer of a romance, period. And that really resonated with you, you mentioned mm -hmm. on the email. Do you find that you're often labeled as more of a transgender author rather than a crime fiction writer? It's such a hard thing to figure out how best to position myself. Because on the one hand, you know, the whole transgender thing is kind of trending a little bit. But the stories that I write are not about the character being transgender. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, do I push that angle? Do I not push that angle? How do you find the, you know, the, the happy middle ground? And, you know, one of the reasons why I really got into writing was because I wanted, you know, so much of a fiction that was LGBT was either coming out stories, transition stories, romance, and erotica. And there's so much more to life Absolutely. than that even as a trans person, I mean, I transitioned way back in the early 1990s. So that's just like way back in my uh, rear view mirror. I deal with job issues and life issues and just all the other things. And so I wanted crime fiction, which was kind of my genre of choice, to reflect that. You know, I wanted characters like me, but didn't want the stories to revolve around that identity. And then when it comes to building an identity of myself as an author, as branding, I'm like, I don't want to be known only as writing transgender stories. Mm -hmm. I'm writing crime fiction stories. At the same time, it's like, okay, do I play the transgender card <laughs> to drag? You know, my big fear is people are going to say, oh, I like crime fiction, but I'm not really not sure if I want to read a story about a transgender character. Mm -hmm. I don't want to you know, I go back and forth between how I want to brand myself. But I, that episode with Damon uh, really did resonate with me because I'm like, he gets me. He understands this struggle between these two identities of me as a crime fiction writer and me as a trans person writing about a trans person. And how do you balance the two? And I totally fangirled <laughs> with him because I'm like, oh, yes, 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 yes. He understands it. And so I'm like, I was really listening intently to what he was sharing about his journey as an author. And of course he writes romance and I write crime fiction. So the two are a little bit different, but still just the struggle of how does one position yourself as a writer when you're, you're trying to go for these two different markets and where do they overlap? Yeah, that's interesting. It's, it's exactly what you mentioned because at the same time you want to, you want readers that want to see themselves in the stories, right? Be able to find the stories, but at the same right. time, it's not, all that the story is about. Exactly. 
I hear a lot of publishers saying, oh, we want more own voices stories or we want more diversity stories. And, mm -hmm. you know, but when it comes time to buying those stories, they're like, oh, wait, you're writing about a transgender character, but it's not a transition story? Oh, well, we're not really that interested. <laughs> it's, like, it's like if you were writing about a, a straight cisgender character and you're only finding coming of age stories. That's all it. And like, there's, there's so more, much there's more. Lot of, yeah. So much more. So, you know, I mean, I have my character. She's going after murderers and human traffickers and terrorists and all this stuff. And it has nothing to do with her being transgender. It's the job, you know. Yeah. So it's a balancing act that I'm still trying to figure out. Do you have any tips? So, for example, if someone was in a similar uh, situation, a similar position, how would you suggest that they fight these stereotypes in a way that will still benefit them as an author? Like I said, I'm still kind of figuring <laughs> yeah, out exactly. But, you know, um, I think being authentic and the characters that I write are not defined by their uh, gender identity or their sexuality or anything like that. But it does shape their experience. You know, there are points in the story where sometimes her past gets brought up and she has to address those issues. In the first book, Chaser, one of the things that happens early on in the story is she had been doing an interview with a local alternative weekly newspaper. And she thought it was just going to be about her being a woman bounty hunter and everything like that. She didn't mention anything about being transgender or anything. And then suddenly she finds out she's been outed as transgender on the cover of this magazine, of this newspaper, and suddenly she gets fired from uh, the bail bond agent that she was working for. She can't get a job with anybody else because nobody wants to work with her. And, and so that's just, I'm touching on the ways that, of the experiences of trans people, but not letting that to define the story because it's, the story isn't about her being blackballed. The story is about her going after this uh, murder suspect. Mm -hmm. So I, it shapes the story without defining the story. And I try to portray it in such a way that it shows the humanity because we, uh, so many of us know what it's like to be rejected for parts of ourselves that we had no control over, the co color of our skin or where we grew up or what we look like or just all these different things. And so finding those commonalities across the aisle, so to speak, of our common humanity, um, that's the way I would try to portray it. Because I struggle with, like on my descriptions, like on Kobo, do I mention that the character is transgender or not? And do I position it in LGBT fiction or do I just position it in crime fiction? Mm -hmm. And right now I'm going with just going with where the, the focus of the story, which is the crime fiction story. And, and it, within the story itself, I focus on the common humanity of the characters. So I guess you're saying focusing on your story and what you want to say is the most important, no matter like marketing or like right. the readers, as long exactly. as the story is what you want it to be. Right. Exactly. That's awesome. Story comes first. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then you mentioned in a recent email exchange, there was a recent controversy with a yeah. cisgender author getting a book deal with the big publisher about a fictional biography of Dr. James Barry. And right. can you just talk a little bit, because the points that you brought up are so interesting and I don't think... I mean, I haven't read about it. Have you read about it before? No, I haven't. You know, and it's interesting. You know, I've, I've been out as transgender for half my life, and I'm only just now learning about who uh, Dr. James Berry was. And it turns out he was a military surgeon, and he was like a pioneer in doing um, cesarean section births. And it turned out that while he was assigned female at, at birth, he lived his entire adult life as a man, identified as a man, and in his will, he asked that his body not be examined because he didn't want it to come out later that, oh, he was female-bodied or however you wanted to find that because he, did, he just identified as a man. And recently, a major publisher offered a deal to a cisgender, and cisgender means non-transgender. It's not a slur or anything. It just means you're not transgender. And she is writing a biography of this man. Problem is that this author is using female pronouns to refer to Dr. Barry. And just she, 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 female, just basically portraying Dr. Barry as secretly that the only reason that he was living as a man was 
because he couldn't become a doctor otherwise. But from what I've read, documented history throughout his entire adult life. And so um, the fact that they are publishing this, despite the outcry from the trench saying, presenting us, you're erasing a little history that we have of authentic transgender people where uh, the whole own voices comes into play and misrepresentation and cultural appropriation because they're trying to erase who this person was. And this is one of the problems when people, for whatever reason, whether it's out of ignorance or out of some other agenda, do not do their proper re- not portray marginalized people with authenticity and with respect. Do you find that a lot of transgender stories are maybe not portrayed correctly as you find when you've been reading them? Or do you find most people are aware of like proper representation? I think it's kind of a 50-50 mix. I've read some that were just like, oh, no, no, no. You know, I see a lot of people haven't really done their proper research or haven't run it by because there's so much to being transgender that people that are outside of the community miss. So much of the lingo, the experiences, the challenges, what it means to transition, what is involved. And if they don't do their proper research, they're going to miss stuff. And if they don't have people that are within the community go through it and say, oh, wait a minute, this works, this doesn't fly. And it's not about us being too sensitive, snowflake kind of things. It's more about authentic representation. If you're going to represent a character and their experience as a marginalized person, you have to do it authentically. And this is where a lot of other stories, you know, um, get criticized that are uh, about maybe African Americans or something, all told from a point of view outside the community. And they, there's backlash. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, I mean, uh, they're one of the great stories that I really enjoy uh, recently is Bound to Die and Cleansed by Fire by Lori Rockenbeck. And she is cisgender, but I believe she has a, a transgender relative. And so she was able to write authentically about a main character. In her case, one of our main characters is a uh, police detective, a homicide detective, who just happens to be a transgender man. And so I loved her books because it's everything that she puts in there about his experience, which again, the story isn't about his experience as a transgender man. It's about him solving a crime, but where that comes into play is authentic. It rings true. And, you know, there are certain tropes like the transgender hooker or the transgender victim. And these tropes are played over and over and over again to the point where people think that's the only experience of transgender people. Like, we're all work as sex workers, and that's not the case. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I mean, there are some people that that do so for survival reasons, but that's just a tiny fraction of our experienced community. And so when we're interested in portraying the characters, if they get that input from members within the community, it actually makes for a better story, a more authentic story, a more three-dimensional character about who these people are and I think that makes for a better story arc as well because it presents challenges and situations that most people wouldn't really think about and so it's a way to actually improve your story rather than limit it. And I think a responsibility of an author is to make sure everything they're putting into a story is true and absolutely because like misinformation can have a big effect. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I mean, and this is true not only with writing marginalized characters, but I mean, if you're writing police procedurals, do your research. (laughs) Otherwise, people are going to say, wait a minute, why why is this, you know, psychologist at the crime scene? (laughs) Or, you know, one of the things I see frequently on, on television shows is they'll take a bloody knife that they find at the crime scene and put it in a plastic evidence bag. I learned from doing research that they don't put it in a plastic bag because otherwise it will mold. They put it in a uh, I didn't know that. <laughs> I know, right? Research. I'm yeah. believing TV shows. And exactly. And, you know, I, one of the things I'll see is like, I, in fact, I recently ran across this. is like uh, someone's house is broken into. And the detective says, well, there were no scratches on the lock, so they didn't pick the lock. I'm like, wait a minute. I know how to pick locks. <laughs> There's a story behind that. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, tell us. <laughs> but my point is, you don't scratch up the outside of the lock when you pick locks. The picks go inside the lock. Yeah. But I, I learned how to pick locks because I used to work at a, a co-working space. And one time, some of the rooms that we had in there uh, had locking, keyed locked doors inside, but we didn't have the keys to them because it had changed, it had become, it, would, it was a bank and then it was city hall and then it was an art center. And it had been so many different things that we'd lost some of the keys over the years. And so um, someone, one day, uh, their kid locked one of the doors and we had no way of getting into this meeting room. And so someone called their wife who happened to have a lock pick set, but they didn't have time to sit down and pick the lock. Yeah. So while we were waiting for her to show up with the lock pick set, I was on YouTube learning yeah. how to pick locks. <laughs> so when she that. arrived, she, she handed me the lock pick set. I'm like, okay, here it is. Boom. I got this. I got I this. So I've never that. broken into a place that I didn't have legal access to. Yes, but it's, disclaimer. It's, yeah. It, exactly. I, I do not recommend this. I thought about bringing my lockpick set up to Vancouver, where I'll be in a couple of weeks, but it turns out that lockpick sets are illegal in Canada. Oh. <laughs> are they? Oh. I didn't know. We're learning stuff today. We're learning. Exactly. Stuff. They're perfectly legal in Arizona, so that kind of tells you something. <laughs> yeah, I get locked out of my room all the time. <laughs> I mean, now I have many keys, like spare keys around Line the house. Goes. But Yeah, but it, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's great po- problem solving, so... Uh, I just want to mention there's a series on YouTube about like a psychologist or like a detective will watch a TV show and like pick out all the errors that the TV show has done. So that's actually a really good resource for anyone who's like interested to see like, (laughs) did they actually get that right? (laughs) I see things like people talking about having trouble with the safety on a Glock. Well, the only safety on a Glock is actually built into the trigger. And so there's no external uh, safety switch that you switch on and off. And every time I read something like that, I'm like, somebody didn't do their research. (laughs) And so so to tie it back to marginalized characters, if you don't do your proper research, first of all, people are going to ding you. I was like, that doesn't make sense. Why would they do that? And the other thing is you have the potential of creating harm. And that's where in the case of uh, the biography of uh, Dr. Barry, you further the trope that transgender people are just men in dresses or, or are dressing as the opposite gender for whatever reason other than that's who they really are. And that is very harmful because the suicide rate among the transgender community is between 40 and 50%. That's way too big. I mean, any number. That's like nine, ti- nine ten times higher than right. what it is with the general population. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So authenticity, not only are you, do you have to worry about your own career, people dinging you on, you know, accuracy, but you have the potential to do real harm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I mean, if you would do the research for, let's say a police, police uh, work, police investigation, why mm-hmm. wouldn't you research another right. topic that you just... Exactly, the, the, the characters. Other. If you're writing char- about characters that are Latino immigrants and you're only portraying them as uh, rapists and gangbangers and all this trope, then you're furthering the harm that people in that community experience, mm-hmm. even if they are legally here you know, I live in Arizona, and there's a, it, it's a really big issue because uh, I have friends who are, you know, they're either legal permanent residents or they're actual citizens. They are born here. I've had a friend of mine who was here almost his, his entire life, didn't even speak Spanish, and he got deported oh to God. Mexico because of this craziness. And like, mm-hmm. you're, you have the potential to do real harm. And the question is, you really want to do that in order to make a buck? That was a good question. Yeah. yeah. Well, then that brings an idea of like a sensitivity reader. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, you mentioned earlier uh, the other author that she had um, someone within her family that was trans. And so right. uh, they mm-hmm. were able to collaborate with that and just provide more information. But right. But in a sense of someone that doesn't have someone close to them where they can ask these questions and learn more, do you find that sensitivity readers... I think a lot of times you, you can, a lot of times if you're, if you're part of like writers groups, especially online, there's a lot of great Facebook groups. And if you're looking for a sensitivity, sensitivity reader in a particular community, you can probably reach out and say, Hey, I'm looking for someone in this community to help 
me make sure that I'm not doing anything, that, that, that my portrayal of this character is authentic to who they are. And um, that's a great way to do it. There are, I think there have been a few databases um, that come and go that list sensitivity readers for a variety of different things, people that are in recovery, people from different nationalities, people from different uh, experiences. And so, uh, I, but I don't have any of those resources handy right now. I know it's, it's called sensitivity reader, but other than someone going over the work after it's already been, been written, do you find that there's any other stages where you would contact someone, like maybe during research or? During research is great. I think because that can inform the, the storytelling itself mm -hmm. because I, I, a lot of times, like, like even if I'm doing research on um, about a, a type of situation or a crime or, or something like I, I've been doing research on human trafficking because that plays into the story that I'm currently working on. And I find like, Oh, well, that's an interesting idea. What if I put that in the story? You know, it could really help flesh out, and make the story itself seem a little less tropey and, and more authentic at the same time. Because if you just do it as, if you base your portrayal of things only on what you see on TV, then not only will it be authentic, but it'll just be kind of stale. But if you do a little bit more research, a lot of times you'll come up with ideas, little sparks that what if I take, what if this happened in the story? Or what if that character did this? or made this mistake, or, you know, it can make a more interesting story, more compelling story. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, so we just want to switch gears back to marketing, because you mentioned at the beginning that um, mm -hmm. publishers didn't always have, they said to you basically they didn't know how to market your book, right. but have you found that you found a way to advertise or market that maybe a publisher yeah. would have been afraid to do, or not know how to do well? One of the things that I found that I could do that the traditional publisher couldn't is I already am involved in the LGBT community. And so I'm members of LGBT writers organizations, um, both online and offline. And so I can reach out to people and in ways that the traditional publisher may not be able to. So I can get, uh, you know, I've been on uh, a number of LGBT podcasts that they wouldn't have know anything about. And the only reason I know about them is because I listen to them, you know, and so I'm able to connect that way. And I, I just find out, find that I'm just better able to reach out. I have more inroads to do that than, than they would. And also, of course, you know, I can do my, uh, as an independent author, I can do AMS ads and I can do a lot of specific marketing related things that I couldn't do. Um, I could do Kobo promotions. I've done a number of Kobo promotions because I'm the publisher of record, whereas I can't do that otherwise. So that's one of the things that I find that, you know, I still have challenges there. Are, you know, certainly the big five have a big reach in other areas. You know, they have direct connections with a, a lot of the major uh, distribution hubs but I find that I'm smaller and I'm also more agile. I can, I can change things. I've recently started using uh, Kalytics to help position myself into different categories. And just within a week of doing, making some changes, I've seen an uptick in sales. And if I can't do that with my traditionally published books, I can't tell, you know, I can't contact my agent or, or my editor and say, hey, I'm showing that these categories are trending more than those categories. Can we move this over? They're just going to do what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. That's, that's part of that model. But because I'm smaller, I'm more agile. And I can change things on the fly. I can change, you know, keywords. And I can change descriptions. And I can change, you know, if I need to, I can change cover art. I can put together bundles. I can, there's so many different things, you know, I've, I still have my audio rights, so I'm going to be doing the audiobooks for all of my books in both series. And so that agility and that control gives me a little bit more of an edge than if I stuck with the traditional publishing route. Can you talk a little bit more about categories? So you were seeing which categories yeah. are more popular and then switching over? Or like, how are you... Uh, yeah, and part of it is, it's, it's really uh, kind of a learning experience because a lot of these categories aren't in the options in a lot of the, when you're, when you're putting in the metadata, they're kind of, you know, you have to put it in with keywords and stuff like that. And some of the big trending 
things in crime fiction right now are vigilante justice, mm -hmm. which my character is, <laughs> she's, a, she's officially licensed to do what she does, but she's kind of a, she kind of bends the rules a little bit. She gets a little vigilante justice. So I found that uh, putting things in that category seems to help. Pulp crime fiction, pulp thrillers, series, just some of the things that are kind of a little bit out of the box that I'm finding, oh, okay, this is, this is how I can do this. And I'm seeing this little uptick in sales. I'm like, okay, I'll just keep going with that. And, you know, six months from now, it may be that maybe vigilante justice isn't as big of a buzz. And maybe there's some other thing, organized crime, maybe a, a more popular search uh, keyword or search phrase. And so I could change the, okay, let's focus on the organized, provided that it fits with the book itself. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to, you know, romance is certainly more popular than crime fiction. I'm not going to position my book as a romance if it's not, because there's a, a romantic sub-thread through it, but it's, there's no happily ever after <laughs> in my story. Romance fans won, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're going to, if, if I tried to position my book as a romance, I would get dinged by romance fans because I did not follow their rules. Mm -hmm. and, and, that's, and I totally get that. So that's why I wouldn't cross over. But for categories that certainly do apply, you know, female sleuth or strong female protagonist or private detective or, you know, amateur sleuth or something like that, that applies to my stories that I might not otherwise, you know, because originally I was going LGBT, LGBT mysteries. Mm -hmm or uh, women's uh, crime fiction or something like that, that in terms of the uh, demand versus supply ratio, they weren't as hot, so I wasn't getting the buzz that I needed to. And if I position myself in other categories that most people are not familiar with, then I'm, I find that I'm getting a little bit more of an edge. That's so interesting. That is. Never it is. I feel like not many people take the time to adjust their categories or like they'll right. just leave it or they won't even change the synopsis, but this like maybe yeah. update more than you would think to do it. <laughs> exactly. And one of my next goals is to really work on my synopsis because, you know, that's kind of like writing a, a pitch, you know, for a query letter. It, it's something that it, it's so hard and you, because you only have so much space to really sell the book and how to, how to, pull readers in and, and hook them so to the point that they'll, they'll hit the buy button. Yeah. And so that's one of the next things I'm going to be working on. That's awesome. Uh, speaking on what you are working on, any new projects on the horizon, anything that we can expect from you? I just finished the rough draft of the third book in my Jinx Baloo Bounty Hunter series. And so I'm going through the editing process of that. It's due to my uh, editor uh, end of May. So I'm hoping to, <laughs> to be finished with that. <laughs> I'm also planning to do a, well, actually coming out later this month, there is an anthology coming out from Down and Out Books, which I love this. This is a great project. It's called Murder A Go Go's. And all of the short stories in this anthology are based on songs by the 80s pop group, The Go-Go's. Oh. <laughs> so our lips are sealed in vacation. I got assigned the title um, uh, Kissing Asphalt. And mm -hmm. so um, I wrote a Jinx Blue a prequel story that's going to mm -hmm. be in there. And that's going to be coming out um, in about a week or so. Awesome. And, cool, yeah. and not only that, but the, the profits uh, go to Planned Parenthood. So oh. the authors don't see a penny of the, the money, but all that goes into Planned Parenthood, which helps uh, women get access to um, reproductive health, cervical screenings and breast cancer screenings and all these really important things. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm really jazzed about the cause and, and the stories. A lot of great authors that are going to be in there, Hillary Davidson, uh, Lori Rader Day, uh, Eric Beatner, and it's edited by Holly West. So a lot of the people that are in the um, down and out books community, they're really, I'm kind of ancillary to that group, but um, they're really talented authors, so I'm really excited about uh, reading the other stories in, in the book. So that's going to be coming out later this month. Um, I'm going to be working on a prequel story that I'm going to be giving away to my um, uh, newsletter subscribers. Yeah. So that'll be kind of my giveaway. Um, right now, um, I've, I've used a short story from one of my other series as kind of the uh, 
lead magnet for my newsletter. And I really wanted to do something for this series, a uh, full-on story, full-on novel that is available only to people that subscribe to my series. So that's on the horizon. Um, I'm also hoping to do audiobooks for all of my books later this year. Mm-hmm. So That's exciting. So, yeah, that's going to be a new challenge. Very cool. Yeah, we have audiobooks coming to Kobo Writing Rhyme. Yes, I know. I'm so excited <laughs> about that. I'm glad you're excited. Very excited. I am very excited. So I'm glad I haven't signed any any deals, any exclusionary deals with CX uh, because I really wanted Bobo and uh, Find Away Voices and everything. So I'm really excited about what you guys are doing. Have That's you been awesome. listening to narrators trying to pick out who you want? Well, you know, I'm wanting to do my own narration. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Cool. Part of it is because it is the main character is transgender. Yeah. Um, finding a transgender narrator is important to me, and but that's also like next to impossible. And so I decided, well, you know, right here on but, this but you never know yes, if there yes, is a yes. transgender <laughs> professional narrator out there. Contact me. Let's talk. Um, <laughs> but otherwise, I'm going to see. You know, I have a background in broadcast production. Oh, that's um, awesome. And so I've already got a room set up in a walk-in closet. So I've got, I've got these thick quilts and everything hanging from the, the, the walls and everything. So I've, I've got the equipment set up. I just need to get finished with this current work in progress. And then I'm going to be focusing on that. Oh, that's cool. Be yeah. A new journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Happy for a real too. <laughs> <laughs> and then just one last fun question. Um, what have you been loving lately? Any book, movie, or TV show you think someone should check out? Sarah Gruen has uh, a series of books called Claire DeWitt. And the first one is Claire DeWitt in the City of the Dead. And it's crime fiction, but with a kind of a Hunter S. Thompson vibe. <laughs> yes. So she's, uh, the, the premise is she's a private detective and she's hired to find this missing person in New Orleans after Katrina. Her philosophy is based on this like obscure book on how to be a detective that's very kind of Taoist, <laughs> hippie kind of, kind of thing. Jedi mindset kind of thing. And it's, it's, it's very innovative, very fresh, and kind of wild. She just kind of goes on this wild journey that's very different than a lot of the crime fiction uh, that I've read. Uh, the second book in the series is Bohemian Highway, I believe. And then there's a third one uh, in the series that I haven't read yet. But it's really a lot of fun. And so if you're looking for a fresh voice, Sarah Gruen's Claire DeWitt series is definitely worth checking out. Perfect. That's awesome. And where can mm-hmm. listeners find you online? DarmaKelleher.com is my website, and there you can uh, get a copy of, uh, right now my, my lead magnet is uh, the first book in my Jinx Blue series, so if you sign up right now, you get a free copy of Chaser. Did everyone also, hear that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a full-on novel, not just a short story or novella, it's a full-on novel. And uh, you can also find me on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, occasionally I pop up on Instagram, I don't take a lot of pictures, so I'm, I'm like, I don't know what to post there. <laughs> I'm 52 years old, so I'm like not looking up proud, you know. I don't use Instagram either. <laughs> it's hard I, think it's, I think it's a w- wonderful outlet, um, but, you know, I'm, I don't take a lot of pictures. Like I said, you know, occasionally I'll take a picture of my cat or I, sometimes I'll do like latte art and I'll take a picture of that. Ooh. And <laughs> Ooh. So, you know, I, I pop up, oh, I, I'm currently doing a column on, uh, or I'm contributing to the Do Some Damage blog. Okay. So you find a lot of great posts on that uh, from not only me, but from other writers as well. So I've been doing that for just a few weeks. So Awesome. We'll have those links to everything you mentioned in our cool. blog post. So thank you so much, Dharma, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. So we hope you enjoyed our interview with Dharma and make sure to check out the blog because we will have links to her gritty crime fiction titles if you're interested. Yeah, and don't forget to review and subscribe to the podcast. And make sure to tune in next week because we have an interview with Adam Cushman. He is the founder of Film 14, which specializes in book trailers. It's a really interesting episode, so make sure to tune in next week. So until next time, thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Kobo Writing Life podcast, where we provide insights and stories from leaders and experimenters in the world of self-publishing. If you want even more information about growing your Kobo sales, check out our blog or find us on social. And if you're just finding us and ready to start your self-publishing journey today, sign up for free at kobo.com slash writing life. Until next time, happy writing.